In this episode, I'm joined by Jeremy Johnson, who is a scholar, writer, and editor for Revelor Press. In this episode, we discuss the philosophy of Jean Gebser, alongside discussions on integral philosophy, process philosophy, and more. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support Hermetics for as little as $2.50 per month, because it's very much appreciated, then please find links in the description below to keep the podcast running indefinitely. Enjoy. So, Jeremy Johnson, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. It's great to be here, James. Thanks for having me. Uh, we are going to be discussing the work of Gene Gebser, um, primarily from your book, uh, Seeing Through the World, Gene Gebser and Integral Consciousness, which was published uh, 2019 by Revelor Press. Um, it's a really, uh, I don't mean this in a, it's a really like quaint little book. It's really nice. Um, it's really well written, really concise in a great way. And, you know, obviously we'll get into this. I was surprised because when you, you look at an overview of Gene Gebser's work, even, you know, just his, his, um, his major work, like the ever present origin, there's a, there's so much going on. So I was surprised by the, the size of your book and the amount that's like packed into it. Um, but it's a really great read and I recommend it for everyone. And we'll, we'll talk about where we can, where people can get that at the end. But, um, just before we jump in with these things, just tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is, uh, what it is you do. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, James. Um, and thanks about the book. It was intended to be a, a kind of a bite sized, um, catalytic read itself. I, I've, I've heard it kind of compared to, uh, kind of a psychoactive, you know, it's, just, it's a little thing, but it, it kind of blooms in your, in your mind as you're reading. And I'm, I'm glad it's, it, it's received that way. Um, but yeah, so as, as you've been saying, I am the author of seeing through the world. I'm a Gebser scholar. I'm an editor for Revelor press as well. I've started my own imprint since the book has come out called integral imprint. So I'm, I've got the editorial hat, I've got the kind of uh, Gibsarian hat on, and I research and write a lot about consciousness studies and the future. So, uh, yeah. Wow, a lot going on. You're also president of the Gibson Society? Yes, yes, technically. It's it's a small academic society in the United States, uh, so it, it sounds very, very auspicious and formal, but it, but it's, it's mostly... Uh, um, an obligation of basically making sure that the conference gets together every year, um, or at least digitally. So uh, it's, a, it's a lot of uh, uh, kind of bureaucratic and uh, uh, cat herding processes. So, but yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. So you're, I mean, I'm always interested with people who, who are scholars of a specific thinker, and it's clear that they've spent sort of, I haven't really asked this before, and I've always been intrigued, but I mean, you know, it's obvious that you probably spent primarily, most of your time primarily talking about Gebser and stuff and the work of Gene Gebser. But I mean, is there any other voices that, uh, you know, philosophical voices that are quite common to your to your research that come in? Uh, you know, it's that's difficult to, to there there are quite a few like um, I would say sort of uh, adjacent to Gebser is like uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin or Sri Aurobindo. There's a lot of uh, transpersonal history literature. So kind of the, the countercultural figures and in the 1960s and 70s, like Michael Murphy and Esselin, and there's some religious studies in there, just in terms of that context. Uh, but for me, yeah, I think it's it's a bit wide ranging when you move on from there because uh, there's Deleuze, of course, there's Bergson, right? Um, Whitehead is sort of looming on the horizon for me as somebody I haven't really taken the time to engage and wrestle with, but I know I ought to. So there's this sinking feeling of guilt and also obligation but coming around to that in the next year yeah so. what i mean i did an episode episode on whitehead recently and it, it's i sort of was like i can't go to i can't go too far here this is a rabbit hole yeah. which i don't want to yeah you know you look at it from afar and you think i've seen i've not in a, i don't mean this in drug true way but i've seen whitehead people and they're like <laughs> yeah they're, they're on it right they're, they're, any chance they get to mention whitehead is always there so i think oh it's a rabbit hole i have to be careful um but that sort of brings us to the hermetics question um you can place three thinkers living or dead into a room and listening on the conversation who do you pick and um as we're specifically talking about gene gebser we can actually include gebser and then add three more yeah I, I was thinking about this question uh for a while and it was difficult to settle on on a uh, on three more plus Gebser, but but I would be very interested in Gebser being in the room with let's say uh, Bruno Latour, mm -hmm. uh, with Whitehead, 
And, mm-hmm. and this is almost like, this is like a nod to my friend. He's a philosopher at the California Institute of Integral Studies, Matt Segal. He's a Whiteheadian. Mm-hmm. And, and that conversation between Gepser and Whitehead, I think, would be really fascinating and, and um, uh, certainly something I'd want to sit in on. Uh, Aurobindo. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, Aurobindo, that's uh, Whitehead, um, and Bruno Latour. So Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so when I spoke about uh, Whitehead, Matt Segal was the person who came on to discuss <laughs> there you go. discuss there you go. Whitehead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, where do you think? Do you think there'd be a common thread that they those that group would immediately reach towards in their discussion? Well, for me, I think uh, particularly Latour. I've been very closely following his his more recent scholarship on mm-hmm. Gaia and critical zones and a lot of his work along those lines because it's very much in. In sympathy with what Gepser, I think, was reaching for in his own work in the 1940s and trying to say we need to imagine space differently and our relationship with space differently. Mm. And Latour has most recently been talking about this whole critical zones project where it's well, we need to abandon the sense of Earth as a globe and move into Earth as this series of shifting, negotiating critical zones. Mm. How do we artistically depict that? How do we aesthetically depict that? How does this change the nature or relationship relationship between subject and object? So I just find, I think that would be a very creative, interesting um, opening conversation to see Gepser and Latour go at it a little bit about space and globes and, and uh, um, zones. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. I mean, Latour, Latour, funnily enough, Latour is someone who... I've only just, I mean, I'm really into Michel Serre, so Latour being sort of the book on conversations with Michel Serre, um, but Latour himself wasn't someone I haven't, I didn't dip into for a long time, and then someone contacted me about doing an episode on his his well, his sort of first well-known book, uh, We we Were Never Modern, and uh, Latour is a strange philosopher. He writes in a strange way. I, it took me a long time to be able to get my head around what 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 he was doing stylistically. Um, and his writing, as you say, even even the early stuff, I'm you know I know he makes, I've heard at least that he makes some fairly big thematic leaps throughout his career and departs from certain things. Um, but so far, it's it's uh, it's been an odd journey. Um, do you think there'd be any major disagreements in the room? Um, well, uh, you know. I, the, I, funny enough, I was thinking about Aurobindo in this context because uh, he's kind of a generation before in, in some sense mm-hmm. in that he was writing in this sort of very Victorian Baroque English style. And there's these levels of reality, you know, and, and I don't I don't know. If, well, I don't know what Latour would think about that, but certainly Gepser had a deep reverence and humility in relationship to Aurobindo. Um, he visited Auroville and, and later in his life and, and uh um, met the the mother Mira Alfasa at Pondicherry. So so I think despite those disagreements, Gepser would probably just be humble and not kind of bring up some of that framing um, and understand its historical context. But I think Latour might have some disagreements there. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. It seems like quite, yeah. It seems so far it seems like probably one of the more pleasant rooms, which won't have too much divisive explosions going on usually people love to put people in who you know they want to sit back and watch we fight watch, yeah. yeah watch yeah. the fireworks um it seems to be either or like either people want to watch some real fireworks uh or they they want some sort of coherent vision which might progress things in some sense but um yeah i mean these thinkers will probably come back in but i'm gonna open up with probably a question which you've been asked many many times um and it's probably like the obvious question Especially considering the title of your book, uh, Gene Gebser, well, the subtitle, Gene Gebser and Integral Consciousness. Um, what is integral philosophy? Uh, you know, I guess we could say what, what, what is the integral in relation to this, both in relation to what is integral philosophy and also what is integral consciousness? Yeah, so the, f- the first one, what is integral philosophy is, is uh, it's, it's sort of a general I mean, I don't know if there is a integral philosophy that they all fit under, but Mm -hmm. I think generally speaking, when you look at somebody like Gepser or somebody like Sri Aurobindo or academic traditions like the California Institute of Integral Studies that kind of came out of sort of an Aurobindian uh, expression on on the West Coast during the the countercultural years, um, that there's there's generally an approach towards uh, transdisciplinary pictures of reality. So they tend to be Mm -hmm. transdisciplinary. They tend to be looking at the evolution of consciousness and they tend to try to um, attempt to integrate different 
theories of reality together kind of uh, present a sort of holism, right? A mm -hmm. whole picture, a big picture. Some of these tend to be uh, a bit different or adjacent to sort of the generalist positivist traditions in the, in the 19th and 20th century in terms of, you know, theories of society or theories of stages. Uh, they, they don't tend to always do that. Um, generally speaking, though, there's a move towards general thinking again, towards generalist thinking mm -hmm. um, and holistic thinking. So how does science and spirituality mm -hmm. work together? And how, what is their relationship? Can they work together better? Um, can we have a meta theoretical framework in, in the 21st century? Can we get beyond the kind of deconstructive impulse of um, Western academia? Um, these are sort of loose threads, but they're all kind of trying to approach the sense of the whole, right? And how mm -hmm. do we actually speak about that? What is its relationship? Uh, so that's generally integral philosophy. Now, when it comes to uh, consciousness or integral consciousness, it, this also depends on who you're asking. Like if you're asking Aurobindo, there's this profound mystical um, vision with a, sort of a synthesis of his own understanding of like um, Western psychology, uh, Darwinism at the time, and then his own sort of Eastern contemplative mysticism. And it's all swirling together. Mm -hmm. Um, to mean something about the divinization of matter or something along those mm -hmm. lines. But then with Gebser, uh, there, there are these contemplative dimensions in it, but for Gebser, he's essentially claiming with integral consciousness that um, the, the, the consciousness of so-called being modern, as Latour would say, mm -hmm. is really one expression of a more of a pluralism of consciousness, a pluralism of ontologies that consist of or, or constitute the human being. And the integral consciousness is, is more of a, a sense of um, being able to move out of that sense of being modern and move into these different forms or have this larger or more intensified sense of the whole. So it's sort of qualitatively, it's attempting to describe a sort of plasticity of our consciousness mm -hmm. to kind of move in and out of being sort of stuck in this sense of linearity, time, subject, object, dualism, et cetera. And then the, there's more to it than that, but that's kind of more of Gepster's way of framing it. Okay. I mean, that's interesting because it seems to escape the, the sort of um, paradox of postmodernism, right? So we're talking about this idea of, um, I guess, Latour sort of touching this on, as you said, this um, multitude of ontologies in relation to what is the, you know, being modern. Um, but in relation to that, there's always this sort of striving, at least since sort of post 70s continental thought to never want to return to uh, the structures of modern philosophy and return to sort of these overarching theories of, right, this is what this is exactly is. And we'll, we'll like, border that off. But then at the same time, that's ended up in the sort of what I would describe personally as sort of a postmodern mess, where they no one wants to give in and sort of... Um, outline something and begin to work from that because there's this sort of um, almost suspicion of any form of formal objective tr truth. But it seems that integral philosophy isn't attending to it in that sense. So it somehow is, would you say it's somehow actually avoiding that uh, connection to the past and actually developing its own thing? So it doesn't become this post or neo thing. It's somehow become its own complete separation. Yeah, and, and that would speak to Gebser's theory of change, as it were, as well, right? That that each of these uh, general ontologies, let's say, for 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 our time, Gebser understood us to have a predominantly mental consciousness. So, so uh, that has to do with the development of subject-object relationship, uh, the sort of Cartesianism, uh, spatial thinking. Uh, a linear sense of time or directed sense of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just the ability to kind to, to perceive from that subject object relationship and make the cut, right? To make a kind of measurement or discernment. But that kind of turned in on itself becomes the kind of the, the hyper deconstructive or the mm -hmm. hyper de uh, hyper atomization of, that we see in postmodernism. So yeah, it is looking at it kind of adjacent to what maybe the the predominant discussions in academia are, are attempting to look at it, right? It's looking at it more from a sort of, um, not just ontological, but also phenomenological, like how are we being in the world? How does the world appear to us? And how are we framing our relationship to space and time as something that kind of helps to shape our thinking and helps mm. to shape 
our cultural productions of philosophy, et cetera. So it really wants to get under in a way like McLuhan talks about cultural ecologies, right? He doesn't mm -hmm. just want to talk about the philosophers as content. Uh, he, he wants to talk about the frames that they're in. Like, okay, well, philosophy and print culture versus philosophy and let's say oral scribal culture might be very different, right? Their senses of the, of the world are different. They have a different relationship and context. So Gebser is kind of looking at it that way. Like how, how is the culture that we're swimming in actually helping to shape the content of our ideas, framing of the world, et cetera. So yeah, it's a little adjacent. It's a little mm. adjacent, but I would say, um, that's not to say that it doesn't speak to some of the problems we're dealing with today. I think the impulse or the desire compulsion to return to meta narratives that we see in, in some integral thinkers like Ken Wilber or uh, in, in sort of the Nordic meta modern approach with, with Hanzi, you know, there's this attempt to kind of synthesize the modern and the postmodern and try these sincere ironies or um, with a sense of, irony, try to reclaim generalist narratives and say, well, we can kind of sprinkle a little bit of deconstructive um, temperance on modernist approaches and modernist projects and maybe bring it back. Mm. Uh, Gebser is really not interested in doing, doing that either. Um, it's not about just the synthesis of ideas, but this is something that cuts deeper into us, right? It, 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 it's striking some kind of, again, this goes into consciousness studies and phenomenology in the sense of um, what is our mode of being in the world and how is that undergoing some kind of mutation or, 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 yeah. or structural transformation? I mean, that's, that's one of the, it's one of the sort of predominant problems of post-structuralism, post-modernism, all those lovely movements, which often overlap and cause many headaches is that as soon as you begin this process of deconstruction or, you know, the, the, the critique of structures, the, the content and qualitative experience of them is then abstracted as some sort of um artifact which is just to be studied as opposed to the actual inherent experience of that quality itself right it's no longer actually lived uh it's taken as like it's taken from afar almost as if they've got this sort of uh scientific lab and everything's sort of an experiment to be put in you, instead of looking at the thing itself you look at the structure and you look at the the overarching meta uh you know scaffolding of it as opposed to saying well what what is this if it's lived? And I mean, this seemed to be a big, a big part when reading your book of, of Gebser is he never, he doesn't avoid, as you've said already, he doesn't avoid the fact that you can't, well, you can't avoid the fact that the philosophies you're talking about are imminently in the process that you're talking about and are being lived. You can't suddenly just take them out and begin to assess them in that sense. Exactly, exactly. And, and that's part of the the challenge, I think, uh, is we have to do this sort of adjacent move that uh, that Latour talks about in the Critical Zones uh, book he came out with a few years ago. Uh, and, and generally, this project of, of really becoming aware, rendering transparent what we are doing presently and how the structure of thinking is being shaped presently by mm -hmm. these underlying ontological as he says, these structures of consciousness, Gebser says. Um, and, and I like Latour's recent example. Uh, he was giving a lecture sort of talking about the, the oddities of, of the modern in the sense that, you know, the way we look at objects is we, we attempt to kind of arrest or freeze them and then observe them in this sort of static state when objects are, are, are temporal. They're, they're in this dynamic interrelationship with things. And, and to, to be modern then and to make this perspectival framing to observe something, whether it's measurement or artwork, is this odd kind of arrest. And mm. you, just the way we can, if, can we begin to look at the way we see and be aware of that and render that transparent. I mean, this, this is really what Gebser is kind of getting at. Can we render our thinking and perception transparent into how we're shaping and participating in the shaping of the world? If we can kind of get out of it, if we can kind of defixate or make it strange or weird it mm. from another angle, that, that sort of helps loosen um, uh, the, the, the problems here in terms of imagining different modes of being in the world. And for Gebser, I think that was his maybe his creative uh, genius, that, that, that he was sensitive enough maybe to the history of these, these transformations, these ontological leaps that has occurred across, across time and space in terms of he has these different structures. I've mentioned the mental, but the, he also describes the mythical and, 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 and the magical and the archaic as these, 
discontinuous leaps into new modes of being. And uh, there, there requires, I think, a, a certain uh, aesthetic and poetic sensibility to, to an approach in order to really kind of get into that, to really step out of ourselves in that way. Mm. But uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, I have a big sort of, uh, sort of, I guess, like an academic question, which would be that it seems what you're describing there in the sense of as soon as you say, we need to look at the way we're seeing, I immediately think of Kant, right? This uh, critique of the conditions of our experience. Um, in what sense does Gebs differentiate from the the, the you know the the Kantian critique of uh, representation? Mm, mm. I think for Gebser, there's this understanding. I mean, he was not really following the philosophical tradition. He was an academic in the sense that he was. Um, transdisciplinary and sort of self-taught. He didn't actually go in, into a philosophy mm. department and talk about this. So he's not exactly speaking to that. But um, I, I would say that for Gebser, these, these modes of being and perceiving are a spiritual process and a participatory process that uh, when we see things in their representation, we're not, we're not seeing mere representation. This is only mm. applicable to the mental structure. This is only applicable mm. to the, the framing that the mental structure sees itself in the world and is able to make sense of the world. So, so I think he would probably question that. Like, what do we mean by representation? Isn't representation more of a, a kind of a mental thing, right? Like we're sort of the world and its appearances and the, and the concepts, right? But, but it, there's something deeper than that. There's a, there's a, there's a way in which we're participating in the world that is much more enmeshed and entangled. Um, that's sort of that's sort of me sidestepping that question a little <laughs> bit, but but because I think Gebser doesn't really want to look at it like that. He really yeah, wants yeah, to yeah. keep the the well, you know, how are we, how does philosophy and the problems of philosophy really stick to this realm of of the conceptual and the and and the mental? And there are other modes of participating, like the gut, right? Um, which is already if we look at, you know, magical practices, et cetera, um, then there's already a whole different set of relationships there that may, may or may not apply to the way Kant frames mm. representation. You know? So, I mean, you've, you've mentioned the, the magic, the mysticism as this sort of uh, key part of his philosophy. Was, was Gebser of any strict religion or, or mystical tradition? He wasn't, which is the interesting thing. He's one of those interesting figures who... Uh, essentially kind of came to mysticism spontaneously as for whatever various reasons uh, or spiritual reasons we might say. Um, he was certainly in the Christian tradition in the sense of being from Europe and, and, and having that maybe speak to him to some mm -hmm. degree. I think there's some really interesting uh, theological commentary throughout his writing, particularly in the ever-present origin of a kind of integral diaphanous Christianity. And that comes up in poetic statements. But um, no, he didn't have a, a, a tradition or a practice. He seemed to arrive at it in, in a series of different biographical experiences. Um, he had an early experience in Spain. Uh, and and they, they Depending on who you're reading, like like Aaron Cheek's work, uh, ha he has a great philosophical biography on on Gebser online, uh, which I think he's developing into a, a book as well. And and there's certainly some alignment there with with uh, in Buddhism they call Turiya, the sense mm -hmm. of uh, transparency or a sort of fourth consciousness that's not waking or dreaming um, or deep sleep. So that seems to be somehow involved in what Gebser meant by integral consciousness. And for Gebser, it's, he seemed to have kind of stumbled on it through his poetic writing and his sort of wanderlust journey through Europe in terms of following the footsteps of Rilke. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, no explicit. And that's to the frustration mm. of, of some of my students too, because <laughs> they go like, where's, what is Gebser's practice then to work with time and transparency and diaphaneity? It's in there in a kind of implicit sense but it's not really explicit. I would say that I would say that's to the benefit, though, right? Because I've often, um, in discussing people who, let's say, don't adhere to some strict tradition, sometimes when they do reference small things, and it's probably thankful that he doesn't, people can begin to go, "Oh, so it's he's talking about this, 
so then it's not allowed to become it's actually its own thing right they say oh it's so he's mentioning the buddhist thing so it's like that and you go well but he, why don't why not just stick with what they've written right instead of uh that cross comparative thing but I, I you know i just think that would be if there was such a thing there then that couldn't be avoided but as there isn't it sort of makes it um more interesting but i mean that, that brings a question and i'm trying not to mention a specific name because my listeners are just going to get frustrated so i'm going to avoid they'll know who i'm on about but i'm going to avoid mentioning a specific name um but for for gebser then is is there as you mentioned this buddhist fourth consciousness or fourth fourth uh dimension and this waking or or deep sleep sleep waking sleep etc is there is there sort of levels of existence and being for gebser I would say uh, he avoids levels. He avoids. Mm. I mean, he really tries to, at least, and and it's it's um, intensities. To, intensities. Sure, uh, sure, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, he goes to great lengths to create these qualifiers like that. Like, well, I'm not talking about stages. Uh, I'm not talking about the expansion of consciousness or the heightening of consciousness, but the intensification. Mm. He's trying to move away from that kind of. Uh, spatial thinking in his own framing, which which is laudable, but it can be frustrating because you kind of have to sidestep so many things and be careful. But anyway, um, in that sense, right, in the sense that there is a wholeness to things, and he mm-hmm. calls it, he's very elusive about it. He says the sup- uh, the suprapersonal, the itself, and he he, he points to Meister Eckhart, the itself, mm-hmm. and he says, you know, adjacent to the phenomena of material history and, and the kind of the, the sense of being incarnate, I guess there is this spiritual dimension or the spiritual. So Mm -hmm. he's very, again, cryptic about what he means by that, but he also uses the word origin obviously in, in that sense, but for Gebser, that's more of, um, I I think it, it is a contemplative, uh, description, something he is, having insight with or experience of that the, the world is brought into being with this intensified spiritual awareness, right? Mm-hmm. Phenomena comes into being is transparent to their, their origin and creatively brought forth through that origin and returns to it in that sense too. So again, phenomena rising and falling in this transparency, that's really how Gebser's trying to, he, he's kind of coming up with his own contemplative language in order to describe this, um, which again is very similar to many different contemplative traditions mm-hmm. describing this process. But that's as close as you get for Gebser for like, mm-hmm. is there a greater reality? Is there some spiritual reality that 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 Gebser sees? Like, yes, and it's also imminent to everything mm-hmm. and free from that imminence at the same time, uh, which you know you brought up okay that's that's uh, that, that's a struggle because i it's clear then that there isn't this if if you're not talking on the, the the type of sort of levels which can does try to avoid but really they are there from the human point of view right there isn't transcendence for gets but it is imminent so how does the imminence avoid its own imminence mm, as you said mm. right well i think for gepser it's 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 neither i mean we might even want to move away like I, I like the word imminence. I, I think mm. I think it it speaks well to what he's describing. But um, there's a, that that tricky problem of you know this mode of consciousness being free from the world. So yeah. So so how do we frame that being free free from uh, free from and free for the world? And I don't know. I don't necessarily have a good answer for that. Okay. Uh, but it, but it seems that that it's neither above or neither merely imminent in this in the material sense of like okay it's the physical cosmos that's that's what he's talking about um it's 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 looking for a kind of language that maybe we haven't as human beings articulated quite well uh, it's between that relationship somehow okay. um that sense of the whole and you you could make imminent and transcendent forms you know uh but but for Gepser, it's it's it permeates everything. It's that trans- sense of transparency. Okay, okay. I mean, this actually does tie back to Latour, especially in his influence from Serre. And it seems that for Gebser, then there is this problem of perhaps he doesn't. I don't remember it specifically from your book, and from from the various other things I watch uh, and and read. But there doesn't seem to be a specific problem of language. But there is an inherent understanding that there is a problem of language because that immediately immediately takes us 
into a certain realm of understanding, which itself is somewhat separate from the ontology and the the lived philosophy that Gebser himself is actually trying to explain. And this is, you know, Latour and Serre, uh, in very practical senses, not as, um, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but grandiose as Gebser, you know, Serre would say, well, how can you, in language, explain the taste of a meal, for instance? You know, that's mm-hmm. an experiential, almost ontological experience, which as soon as you begin to write about it, you reduce it, as we've been talking about, onto a sort of, well, that isn't, at, they're, they're not the same thing at all, and they never mm-hmm. can be. And it, do you think that's the, uh, an immediate problem um, in Gebserian philosophy, that as soon as there is this mode of articulation, then we are stuck with, well, I mean imminence, but I don't mean imminence, and we're, t- mm-hmm. we're sort of talking about levels, but we're not talking about levels, and as soon as you do that, you, you're no longer actually living it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's mm-hmm. actually, it's a philosophy which is meant to be in itself almost ontological, of being, in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I like the way you're describing that. I, I think I think so. I think so. And, and Gebser brings that up. It's 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 really kind of laced around all of his writing that oh <laughs> um, that okay, we can't really say it, you know. Or yeah. when I say supersede, you know, he'll add like quotes around it because mm. it's like I'm using a metaphor of transcending, but I can't really like I, I'm almost he's almost meta modern in that sense that he's like ironically using these spatial metaphors, knowing that they're limited. Um, but that also becomes a very interesting preoccupation for him. And, and this question of, well, can, can language um, uh, in some sense approximate uh, or, or impart that ontology? Mm. Now, his, his, his commentary on language throughout all of his writing is really interesting because okay. you think to some degree I apologize degree for can. my ignorance. Though. No, 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 not at all. But that there's, 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 there's a sense in which um, we can trace uh, etymologically the roots of words, and and you know at least in Gebser's reading of etymology, you can kind of see the mythical more at work in earlier language than you do in in later um, in terms of uh, in terms of the ger- the original German, but for us as well in English. So so you, maybe there's more ambiguity and polarity, and then later on a word means one thing or another thing, right? There's more kind of dualism and abstraction in later language. So in some ways, our language can, um, to some capacity, impart mm. what it is, what we as beings are embodying and experiencing um, it, without the language necessarily. So, so there's that. But then in in his work, he's also very preoccupied with, well, what are the new concepts? Can can language incorporate or leave room for or leave gaps to allow in this fourth dimension or this time dimension that he's talking about? The sense of transparency. Can language become more like that? Mm-hmm. Can our can philosophy become um, uh, um, suffused by time and temporics and not the mere conceptual, right? Not the mere static conceptual. Can concepts themselves become more like that aliveness of human experience? So I think he was being a poet first and foremost. Mm-hmm. He's probably like, oh, absolutely, language can do it um, in terms of like a work of art, right? That is multidimensional and can impart quite a bit in, in the engagement with that art. I think he saw language as uh, performing a similar role, although albeit very challenging when it comes to, can philosophy do this? Can meta theories do this? Can concepts become more time infused? I think that was the question he had, but I, I don't know if he necessarily resolved it. Um, and I think we're still struggling with that as, as we see, even like in our ability to try to communicate this right now. Um, <laughs> But that is, again, why I would probably want him and Whitehead to sit in a room together and be like, well, here's a guy who's all about process and, and reality. So please have this conversation and see if we can actually do it. So do you think what, that's where these these um, these categories, I mean, I don't want to say categories once again, but, uh, you know, the mythic, the mental, etc. Do you think that's where where they, they are brought in by Gebser as a means to sort of alleviate some of the problems of communication? Sure. Sure. Yes. And, and, you know, it's funny, he even says, maybe there are other structures in between those. And uh, uh, whenever he's talking about one in, in, in its historical context, he's always layering and lacing, finding some way to loop in the others. Mm. And so the picture you get is more 
it, it, it's more multidimensional. When you're talking about the mental, you also have to talk about how the magical consciousness and the mythical and the archaic are all kind of in a dynamic interrelationship that's always processual and moving and morphing. And so he's really attempting to describe a kind of ecological thinking in that sense, in that there's all these relationships and it's very difficult to, to cut out the other relationships to abstract only one because they're all dynamically playing into, into a process. So he's always trying to write in that way. And that can be maybe why he's, he's somewhat confusing for readers because mm -hmm. you enter this sort of thicket of relationships and contexts and processes. Um, so in some way he's attempting his own thinking to, to, to behave in a way that is integral and transparent to the mm -hmm. whole dynamic process. Okay. Is, is that somewhat what he then means by the ever-present origin? To that, some capacity, yeah. Almost I, I don't want to bring in Deleuze, but almost a uh, ontological rhizomatic structure. Yeah. No, I've used, I, I just posted something, a um, little, little thought exercise recently on, on uh, the, the structures and what we mean by what Gepser meant by structures and what, and how we're using that in, in my context with my writing in classes. Um, yeah, they're not really meant to be, okay, here's some ideological superstructure, conceptual mm. structure, a box to put everything in and to label and categorize. Um, it, it's, attempt, it's an attempt to describe a, a mode of being and living and relationship with time and space. And so it's more alive. It's meant to be more alive. So yeah. it's more of a kind of a structure of a rhizome. Um, or it's, it's, a, it's structural in the sense of something that is embodied, dynamic, alive, and in relationship with other things. And so if we see human consciousness as this, um, I don't know, multi-layered folding and unfolding and processual series of ontologies, they're all interrelated with one another. They're all dynamically co-informing one another, like a mycelial network or a rhizome or, or a, a forest, just in terms of the more multi-species uh, uh, view of that. And so I think that's really where Gepser's trying to go with his thinking, that the structure's do look more like that rhizome uh, and they are all interrelated at all times. So, so when you enter into any one structure, you're really in a relationship always already with all the others. Um, now that's not quite what it means by ever present origin. Uh, that's also, <laughs> this kind of goes into the contemplative again, right? That, that turia of, of, of things arising um, in this sort of spiritual present. Uh, but for Gepser, it's like, they don't, they're not, they're not dissonant, like the, to be able to become sufficiently present in that spiritual capacity to, to allow the, the sense of the whole to, to really come to the forefront, mm -hmm. right? Cultivating transparency is a spiritual practice, but also a practice of intensifying our consciousness so that um, in our experience of time and in, in somewhat in the linear sense of there being a deep past and a history of consciousness, and also a sense of maybe the future as well in the present, both for Gepser anyway, are, are transparent to one another and co-informing the present and co-shaping the present. And that's the kind of intensification he's, he's attempting to speak to. Mm. Okay. I'm going to throw out quite an abstract question because this, this is the, the overlap that, that I sort of adore in philosophy with Sarah and Gurdjieff <laughs> and others. Do you think, in a Gebserian sense, do you, you, not in a Gebserian sense, do you think it would be possible from his writings to develop a Gebserian form of development, a practical system or a practical system of mysticism in relation to Gebser's mm. philosophy? I do. I do think that. <laughs> I, I, it hasn't been done yet, but I do think it can be done because there's enough. First of all, it, studying it, studying the different structures, you really get a sense that whenever he's talking about any given structure, he's really talking about, well, okay, the, the gut is associated with the magic. And so there's a lot of discussion today about somatics and like gut cognition and intuition. And um, uh, I'm following quite a few thinkers on, uh, on like animist somatics and, and such, mm -hmm. and it has to do with the sort of the centers of 
um, uh, the body, not chakras per se, but like the gut, the heart, the head, et cetera. So there's mm -hmm. this sort of embodied set of practices readily, like immediately available in terms of investigating that, like if we really want to investigate the magic. Um, and what I've been saying is uh, implicit in, in, in Gebser's writing is the sense that um, he doesn't give you techniques, but he's he sort of suggests like, well, what we really need to do is sort of defixate from the mental consciousness, right? To move out of mm -hmm. this sort of fixation on abstraction and dissociation from, from these earlier structures and kind of come, go back into them and, mm -hmm. and, and bring them back into a concrete relationship. And he means by that is sort of like the, the, the magical consciousness is not just an abstract layer of history it's like it's dynamically alive it's in our body there's ways we can kind of come in contact with it um and and develop a a, a more healthy and active relationship with this mm. and same with the mythic so in really in some ways he's saying reconnect with those concretize them in yourself and then have this ability to sort of not become subsumed necessarily by them either because that's the other danger right that mm -hmm that what we have dissociated from as moderns might really want to come back, like roaring back mm. and, and subsume us, like, like Jung talked about, right? The depths kind of coming up, how he had to do the red book process or to, in order to kind of keep himself afloat from being consumed by these mm. psychical intensities. I think Epster would probably have a similar recommendation, right? That there needs to be the sense of equanimity as you are exploring these different ontologies. And so, but what you get overall from looking at that process is this sense of um, exploring these different dimensions of, of, of being, these different structures and moving in a sort of, with a sort of plasticity in and out of them. And what emerges in that sense of morphing, shifting, moving in and out, observing how they're dynamically relating to one another. There's like that space between them that begins to coalesce. And I think maybe that's the element of grace in the practice, but what hopefully emerges is this sense of transparency or this sort of, Gebser says, a spiritual epiphany of, of, of the diaphanous, right? The diaphanous sense of the whole or origin or the spiritual kind of coming to the forefront in relationship with all these different aspects of our being. So there, I think there's quite a profound possibility of a contemplative, set, rigorous set of contemplative practices. And some of them not only involve like the somatics of the body or exploring you know, psychical intensities and, and the unconscious, right? Sort of, a, sort of an active imagination process maybe for the mythic, but also um, concretizing the mental, right? Understanding the mental as an embodied ontological structure being in the world, right? Really kind of grokking what it actually is instead of taking it as the default channel. Uh, and, and so that kind of plasticity, movement between the structures and then the emergent sense of the whole, th there's, there's, a, there's a practice in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, at the, at the center of that is this sort of equanimous approach where uh, you really want to live and all of these dimensions, not merely abstract them, but also not be subsumed by them. And that requires, that's difficult. That's really difficult. Mm -hmm. So, okay. I mean, I'm interested in this, in this idea of the gut in relation to magic. And what I'd say is it seems that, I mean, there's a lot going on, as we said at the start, it's always tough because you can relate it to all these other mystical traditions. And mm -hmm. um, I don't want to tie Gebsa in with the actual perennial tradition, but that idea of a sort of continual, quote unquote wisdom or current which is there which people throughout certain times have then developed into their own thing so and I think my, my speaking personally that's why people often notice similarities is because there may very well be something which is just in time which is this uh recurrent or concurrent uh once again the problem of language truth mm -hmm. if you want to want to do it and people sort of uh intensify and develop it in their own ways but this this thing of the the gut in relation to the mental and also i guess as you said in relation to like the centers in relation to the emotional it seems that this problem of embodiment seems to be one of the primary problems of much contemporary philosophy as to why they they, they can't really get anywhere is this this sort of continual emphasis on the um sovereignty of the head as if that could solve absolutely everything mm -hmm. um and and anything worth its weight is 
anything valuable must be a conclusion of of the mind of the intellect and it seems that you know just recent something recently i've been reading the the emotions and the and the mind they have a relationship with time which the body doesn't right the emotions and the mind then go off into the future that's where they usually are or they usually you know and the emotions are usually in the past etc but the the body and embodiment doesn't have this option. And so if you're conscious of your body, it's always present. I'm trying not to get too new and new agey here, but in this sense of the fact you were talking about the idea of the mental becoming embodied, is that in sort of a Gebserian way, the idea of uh, removing the mental from various uh, fantasies in, that it's having in time and bringing it back to the what it should actually be living now. Mm, mm. Sure. Yes. <laughs> I think that is a big move that happens with Gebser, or the, at least a suggestion in terms of this practice for Gebser. It's, it's how can we become less dissociated and less completely in our heads and then actually get into the body and put the head back in relationship with the rest of these sort of somatic intelligences that are that operate under different principles and have different relationships with the present. Now, that doesn't mean we don't we stop being doing mental stuff and, mm. and projecting to the future and abstracting. It's just the, the problem is, 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 is a kind of inflation of that, right? A kind of fixation, the inability to move outside of that process, which has been predominantly our, our, our crisis, at least the, how Gebser frames it is. We are stuck with dissociation. We don't seem to be able to get out of dissociation. We want to double down on it in mm. order to do um, to more thinking about it. I'm thinking of like Tim Morton making that quip about anything you can do I can do meta is the sort of move of modernity that it's always performing on itself. And so how do we step out of that? How do we bring that back down to earth as, as Latour also talks about in the sort of the, the larger anthropological sense of um, Latour has a different context for that, that phrase down to earth. But I think the principle of, of bringing modernity back down to earth and bringing the mental back down into the body with this sense of transparency is exactly that kind of move Gebser's also speaking to. Okay. Okay. And is this, I mean, the, the one sort of, there's a, there's just there's a, a couple of topics that themes that I haven't touched on, which we probably have touched on, but is this, you know, Gebser speaks of perspective and the idea of a perspective and unperspective. And would this move back down to the earth? Would that, could that be taken in relation to this idea of perspective limitations? Sure. I, I think for, for Gebser, the, that language, I know it can be a little weird because he's got these structures and then he's also got these forms of perspective and how do they all match up? Um, and in some way, he's sort of, they, they kind of got grandfathered into his thinking because um, his earlier work used that framing, unperspectival, perspectival, aperspectival, at first to attempt to describe um, what would later become the structures of consciousness, but he seems to be fine keeping them in the, his language anyway in, in his later work. So, but yeah, I think in terms of perspective, he's, he's, he is talking about modernity, the Renaissance perspective, and not just an art, but really a kind of phenomenology of the modern as, as sort of standing apart from nature and observing it as a thinking head, you know, mm -hmm. thinking is being in that Descartes sense. Um, so there is that orientation, which has to be brought back again into this sort of balance with these others. Uh, but that's the perspectival. Perspectival thinking is a sort of standing apart, spatializing the world, making that um, uh, in that setup, making that horizon point, right? That mm -hmm. vanishing point on the horizon. Um, but there's this move that we do in that, that McLuhan talks about with the alpha, with the print script, right? That mm -hmm. it breaks up reality, that it sort of fragments things um, by measuring them and discerning them. And mm -hmm. there's a great, there's a great power in that we obviously see in modernity from empirical science and uh, the industrial revolution, et cetera. But then the other, the flip side of that is then when we get stuck on that, then that's all we can do. We bring that cutting perspectival knife to any situation. Um, and it's, it's become hyperinflated. So part of the a perspectival move is this, uh, he, he uses 
the prefix alpha privativum. So as he says, it's freedom from, and it's also freedom for. So he doesn't want to discount perspective. He just wants perspective to be rendered transparent in relationship to the unperspectival. Mm -hmm. And then with the aperspectival, again, this, this freedom from freedom for the sense of transparency is you could still do that. You could still enter the perspectival world and perspectival thinking and make that cut. But it's, it's now in um, may, maybe because the sense of the whole has greater um, say, it's now in a better relationship. It's not as inflated. It's not as fixated. So, yeah. And, and, and part of that is also the sense that the unperspectival is, it has equally valid modes of being in the world. And I think in conceptual ways, contemporary science might, uh, science, uh, humanities might be getting into this with like uh, the resurg resurgence of interest in animism and, and panpsychism and, and um, object oriented ontology being another kind of thing where they're, you know, that, that subject object distinction is really kind of becoming blurry or a little entangled or um, a little stranger. So we see that starting to get massaged into our thinking right now or, or showing up in our thinking. Um, but Gebser is, again, this is more of a, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't just stop with mm. object-oriented ontology or interesting philosophies that try to accommodate that. It's, it, it's, it needs to be this spiritual process as well. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. the, sort of, mm -hmm. yeah. the, the broad picture of the perspectival epochs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. Um, it's always difficult to talk about uh, sort of quote unquote process, or as you say, integral philosophy, because it's you can't just take one thing and then use that as some sort of route and develop from that. But uh, I mean, that does that does beg a big question: that do you, do you think there ever could be such a thing as a, a, an end or a telos or, or a teleology for Gebser? So uh, Gebser was very adamant that he was not interested in teleology and yet and yet <laughs> there is this sense in his writing that um a spiritual process is going on in the world and that the it's almost as if there's an, a, a new ground underneath us this sort of integral a perspectival reality that everything has to adhere to right mm -hmm. and if it doesn't then it, it becomes increasingly deficient and, and, and crisis bound. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that very much in that sense, he's, he's looking at the 20th century as this, um, attempt by the perspectival mental world to master the intensities of time. And for Gebser, time is this very complicated subject, but it's essentially not just linear time. It's magical timelessness It's mythical rhythmicity. It's, it's sort of this intensity of the whole of the spiritual whole for him which sounds confusing and I know it is, and I, I, I'm trying to search a pro for a process to kind of discern that a little bit better um, because he says, you know, time in its, in its actual expression is time freedom, right? Again, it's that alpha privativum. It's that sense of the whole. It's the fourth or fifth dimension, but it's not limited to any of those. So this intensity of time for Gebser is this sort of, I wouldn't exactly call it teleological, but it could be read that way. Whereas this sort of, it wants to be realized in the world, right? It wants to be realized in human consciousness, this consciousness of the whole, this integral ontology. And to some degree, there is, you could read it that way, that that is intensifying and it's drawing us to it like a new attractor, right? Mm. Um, that kind of language does readily kind of work with Gebser. Although again, he himself was like, I'm not talking about teleology. Mm. Teleology is about a direction. And, and for me, it's like, for, for me, and by that I mean by, by Gebser, he's saying, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this intensification process. That's not an expansion. It's not going in a direction. It's present and it's intensifying. Mm -hmm. So we might be hair splitting, you know, like, yeah. and, and some Gebserians even say that, like, but he, he kind of was talking about a teleological process. So I leave that to readers to, to make their own discernment about, you know, maybe we can read teleology in that more complicated way because he was, after all, very... Um, uh, what do you call it? Affirming of of Tehard's writing, and Tehard was extremely teleological in the sense of the omega point, right, and the universe being drawn toward this convergence. And he was saying, "Hey, that's that's the the Christian Catholic Jesuit approach, but it's talking about the same thing I am talking about." So mm -hmm. 
those those little tensions are in there and an interpretation could be made for teleology so very like very roughly it's not a teleology in, in relation to sort of um uh, let's say typical philosophy of space and time but it's tele it's like an ontological teleology very yeah, roughly yeah yeah it's almost like that kind of trippy sense of teleology like um like Mc terence mckenna and his like um poetic riffs on you know the eschaton or the object at the end of history drawing us to it there's this implication that it's not really in linear time but it's kind of pressing into linear time it's sort of moving us or drawing us you could frame it maybe in that way to some degree and and get away with it with a get away. Uh, okay. yeah okay i feel we've covered a lot in a, in a quick quick yeah quick time there do you, th do you think you're asking good questions you're going to like the the difficult really good like the how big do we stuff. actually is this teleology or is this <laughs> not teleology yeah uh, just ask for the answers straight away <laughs> yeah um okay i mean is is there any key areas of gibbs's thought i mean obviously there's going to be but is there any key um i guess abstract areas which we've which we've sort of criminally overlooked here <laughs> uh Maybe just, I mean, I know we were just touching on time, uh, but I think the part of the, a lot of folks like to focus on Gepser's careful attention to the earlier structures, the unperspectival world, the magic and the mythic. Um, and, and for good reason, he's very detailed about them. He has a, a very exhaustive study of them in, in, in such a way that there's so many examples, historical artifacts, uh, works of art, et cetera, it really kind of brings it to life. And I think that helps readers experience that defixation from the mental that Gepser talks about being so important. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, I think the the most important work, and this is partly what I'm developing in my own, uh, in the next book, uh, Fragments of an Integral Futurism, is, is the sense of the future and, is how integral consciousness has to do with this new relationship with time. But I know we've been talking about eschatons and teleology and time freedom, and, and those sound very kind of beyond us in a way, like, okay, maybe this is some great spiritual process. But I think the, the, the applicability for Gepser in the present is much more tangible in that even during his study in 1949 and 1950, when he's talking about integral and time freedom, what he's drawing on um, are just so many, so much, I'm mean, just architecture, music, psychology, biology. He's really looking at the concrete in the way um, it's showing up in our cultural phenomenology, this theme mm -hmm. of t temporix, this theme of what well, he says, temporix, transparency, the supersession of dualisms are like, the criteria he's really looking at when it comes to um, how it's showing up in culture. And I think that's important. And it's, it's, it's work for maybe contemporary Gipsarians to do in terms of there is a methodology there, and then there is a way you can really concretize it for folks. And I'll just bring up like one or two examples um, in the contemporary. When I when we're talking about time being a theme, uh, if the perspectival world is more about the spatialization of reality, measurement, categorization, subject, object, et cetera, the a perspectival for Gepser does have qualities that are specific to it and unique to it. The integral structure has unique qualities, and that is um, a kind of uh, mutation in our language and understanding and relationship with temporix. It becomes much more fluid, much more processual, much, much less linear and more non-linear, mm -hmm. but that would mean that's going to show up in our art, in our media, in our, wor our works of philosophy, and even just as more contemporary academics describe the structure of feeling of our times. And I would say we're all undergoing this intensification of time in the present with the Anthropocene, right? With the COVID lockdown, this um, halting of the hyper productivity of the world for a moment, right? And then watching the entire economy sort of stumble over itself as that happened. Um, and then opening things back up and then shutting them again. So there's this like uh, false start, right? This like broken rhythm that we are undergoing collectively at the moment. 
within this context, this ambient, larger context of the Anthropocene, this looming sense that, okay, our civilization has sort of built itself around momentum, speed, increasing productivity, increasing capital. We sense that directedness of time is about to crash into the realities of the planet. And there is the sense in which the past, just in terms of um, you know, that history of the industrial revolution and, and capitalism is, is sort of haunting us, uh, the past actions. This is what Andreas Malm talks about um, in his book, uh, The Progress of the Storm, like the, 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 the presence of the past is alive in the, in the contemporary climate, the weirdness of climate, right? The warming of climate. Uh, the, our ancestors are present there, right? Mm. Our collective activities of fossil fuel extraction and usage. Uh, the sense of the future is also looming for us right now too, about what we're doing in the present and how we aren't slowing or, or, or carbon, uh, curving carbon emissions, right? The sense in which like what we're doing has an implication for the future. So in some ways our, our future generations are kind of, we feel the, their eyes, we feel their gaze upon us and how we're not really handling this. So there is this maybe more in a negative or existential angst kind of sense, but there is this structure of feeling around time right now. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you know, I would probably add a fourth person to that table of discussion. It would probably be McLuhan mm -hmm. because I'm thinking of what he said about, um, the kind of consciousness that we need in electronic media is the sense in which everything we're we are doing in the present. Um, we need to know everything, like all of the repercussions, all of the reverberations mm -hmm. in some sense are always echoing back to us in this, these ever shortening feedback loops. Yeah. So we kind of have to move in the context of the planetary in this sort of um, acoustic auditory sense of the past, the present and the future are always sending reverberations back to us in the present. And that's how we have to navigate complexity and feedback loops and dynamics. We always have to have a sense of the future and the present because it, it will ripple back to us. So how do we have a consciousness in which that kind of time is constantly something we're aware of to navigate with all of these problems, right? Mm. So I would say a consciousness of time is, is, is not just something very, very abstract and maybe only for the mystics uh, who were able to be sufficiently present. Um, a consciousness of time is increasingly becoming uh, our culture, global civilization's predominant concern and anxiety and theme. And in that way, I would say Gepser hasn't been looked at mm -hmm. as much as I wish he had. You know, he's kind of been seen as, okay, well, he developed these structures. Ken Wilber has used him. There's a whole history of consciousness cool, but I think Gebser's commentary on the present is really fascinating and, and needs to be looked at. Yeah, I mean, what you say about being, you know, just the mystics being present, I think being present itself, people think it's just about dealing with like being, I'm going to say Western mindful, right? Like, you could, mm. which is sort of just, you know, it's not the same as actual mindfulness, because that that does yeah. have connotations with, with an expansive temporality. Western mindfulness of like, oh, yeah, of course, I'm present. I'm here right now. Like, on the mo it's not the moment you know it, it that attentiveness in the present is to do with that sort of patchworked time which you're talking about where everything is there in some form of transparency and there isn't you aren't completely identified with the future or the past in some form of uh like let's say uh, industrial optimistic progress right so virilio virilio talks about if you invent the car you invent the car crash but if you take that in a linear fashion then it doesn't matter because the car crash hasn't come yet whereas the gebsarian view of viewing that would be as you're making the car it's also crashing in some sense but that's right, not yeah, yeah. but that's not pessimistic that's uh you know being attentive of the whole situation at once and not i guess buying into some uh, uh you know very constrained form of time exactly exactly and and there's a there's an escape and being able to partition time like the mental does like, mm -hmm. well, that it's not tomorrow yet. So let me let someone else worry about that tomorrow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Let someone else worry about the car crash. Like right now we're making gonna, money, yeah, we're making making investors. Money, yeah. We're, you know, so there's this, there's a cutting up of time, which is a quintessential for, for the mental. Um, and yeah, so I think that as you're saying that it's not the mirror here and now it's the, the present actually 
is 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 sensitive to those inner relationships and um yeah a consciousness around that at the very least is, is what <laughs> integral integrality is really talking about mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so i mean i guess it's difficult i always ask scholars of what, who i see as sort of figures that aren't so well known this and i guess from your perspective it's difficult because you're working with him all the time and working with his work all the time sorry um but do you do you feel gibbs has been critically overlooked yes, and, it, and if so uh, if so why of course yeah I, I think a few reasons maybe one being he was certainly spiritual mm -hmm. and very poetic uh he did not follow the the he was not part of the tradition of 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 post-structuralist thinking or post-war thinking necessarily. So he wasn't in that milieu or embedded in that. So um, he was kind of adjacent to it. Uh, he certainly, I mean, he's been adapted by comparative civilizations, departments and, and things along those lines. So I think that's not really in vogue anyway. Um, and then when it comes to even the, the, the subcultural movements, like the, like Ken Wilbur with the, transpersonal psychology and his integral theory in the 1980s, Gebser was more of a, um, a stepping stone for Wilbur to create this sort of big theory of everything. And, and, and he kind of adapts Gebser's terminology, as different structures into stages in his own framework. So Gebser hasn't really had his own moment, I think, to really shine in that sense. Also, it, the another critical problem has been uh, the lack of, of English translation, and at least in the Anglo philosophical world. Um, so, so there's been some the limitations. Only, the only philosophical world that matters, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that those have been some of the challenges and limitations, but um, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's changing um, I, in, in the work that I've been doing with, mm. with publishing my book and, and, and speaking with folks. Uh, there does seem to be a lot of receptivity like oh yeah he's putting his finger on something about this time thing that that i already knew but he's articulating it right um so we'll see about the the future i think that might be changing mm -hmm. okay okay where would you recommend people to to begin with Gebsa? Uh, i hate to tout my own book but it it was intended to be like a bite-sized version mm -hmm. um doing my best to 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 encapsulate some major beats from the ever-present origin um you know there again there's also a really good philosophical biography uh by aaron cheek on on his website which is it's a nice long read and it's again more more biographical but there's a lot of excerpts and fragments of translations in there that are not in english anywhere else so that's a good resource as well um and of course you could Always check out the the Gene Gepser Society, gepser.org, uh, which is our little academic society. We have a few journals uh, in there, a couple of decades of uh, publications that folks might be interested in. So right around there, somewhere in there, maybe start mm -hmm. with my book. Um, and, and again, I don't think, you know, for folks who may not feel uh, up to reading a giant tome, a giant thick um, Germanic tome of, of writing, um, I would suggest maybe they pick up the text anyway and, and enter it rhizomatically as, as you know, uh, any which way, like a thousand plateaus, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's fun that way. And then too, it, it kind of works on you as I write about in my book. It has a Gebser style, even in the translation, I think has a, 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 an imparting of what he's talking about. It works on you. It changes the way you think to some degree, um, so I recommend it anyway, even if you're not going to read it cover to cover. Okay. And yeah, okay. And your book can be, I'm assuming, can be bought from the, uh, is this, where, uh, revelor.press, www.revelor.press. Yes. Um, yes. And you, you have your own imprint now there called? Integral Imprints. And okay. you'll probably see it on the, the homepage. Uh, lots of books coming down the pipe. Uh, I'll be able to talk about them soon, but mm -hmm. um, we've already come out with uh, Sean Kelly's um, uh, Becoming Gaia, which is a great book. It's it's sort of, uh, he, he wrote Coming Home like a, over a decade ago now. So it's a major update on his own work, kind of bringing in Gebser and Edgar Morin and Joanna Macy and talking about the, the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a fantastic work. 
and I think the culmination of many years of study. Um, and there's a few other books. They, they're going to tend to be philosophical texts uh, mm -hmm. um, or, or be uh, urging my, my fellow folks who are in academia to transform their theses into works of, of public philosophy, which mm -hmm. is difficult. It's difficult to, to actually kind of massage that writing into something a bit more accessible. So, but uh, yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, it seems like a good place to finish up. Uh, Jeremy Johnson, thanks very much for coming on. Thank you, James. It's been fun.